Hello. All right, we are live. I'll get started. Let me just wait for a few people to, to join on. Oh, hi. Welcome. Okay, I'll get started then. Hello and welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Isabel Kent and today I'm going to be speaking with the artist Wolf von Lenkiewicz uh, for the Athena Art Foundation. Athena is a new non-profit digital platform promoting engagement with pre-modern art. Its main platform is its website, a hub which presents innovative digital content about exhibitions, podcasts uh, and other resources. And it also creates a lot of original content, including this very series of interviews. Um, now, Wolf is a British artist and painter living and working in London. His art reconfigures iconic images from the past, including works by Leonardo and Dürer, Jericho, to name but a few. It's incredibly art historically literate. Um, and Wolf comes from a large a family of artists that stretches back to uh, Ludwig of Bavaria. His work has been exhibited around the world, most recently in a large solo show in the Saatchi Gallery and at an exhibition uh, on Cranach at Compton Verney, uh, and also at an exhibition in Helsinki. Trained as a philosopher at the University of York, his art raises in questions about the construction of history, about epistemology and craft. So I can already tell that this is going to be a very rich philosophical discussion about art and the place of art history in our modern moment and what that what that uh, implies. So without further ado, I'll get Wolf onto the chat. Let's uh, just invite him now and we can get started. Okay. Hello. Hey. Hi. How's it going? You, you well, you well, can you hear me? Very well, I can hear you, yes. Okay. Great. And, and where are you at the moment? I think this is always good to kind of situate uh, the people who are watching this. Yeah, I've been working all day in my studio. Mm. I'm, I'm having a problem with the sound cutting out for you occasionally. Are you having that problem for me? I can hear you clearly. Um, I'll just see if I can the volume. Is that a bit better? I think so. Let's okay. We'll 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 get going, and if it's if it's a problem later, we can always we can always work it out then. Um, right. So so I wanted to start off. I know this conversation is going to get deep into the sort of aesthetics and philosophy and all of these things that we've that we've talked about. Um, but I thought we could start off kind of situating you you and how you know you first came to art history uh, because your work is so suffused with references and with with all of this. So where did that interest begin, and and how did that kind of come about? Yeah, well, I remember I was uh, probably about 12 and uh, I, I was living in the countryside and my grandmother, she was this horrible kind of wizened Edwardian creature, you know, um, she would be offering me these after eights, which are like all square chocolates. And um, she would talk about her memories and she had this book showed me once and it had the last supper by Leonardo da Vinci in it and I just recall not liking it very much at all uh, which since then obviously I've I adore it but uh, she also had another book which was the one I did like and it was the Ghent Old Piece by Jan van Eyck so I was kind of struck at that point by the Flemish masters and started drawing quite a lot and my father was a painter, it's a very fine one. And as you said, my great grandfather was also court painter to Ludwig of Bavaria, painting the frescoes in Neuschwanstein. So I guess I had a lot to live up to. Yeah. Yeah. I know, amazing. So so you were in the countryside with these with these big art books. When was your sort of first interaction with, with the paintings themselves? Did you did you go to museums a lot as a as a kid? Did you have access to that? And yeah, I I, I, I took several trips to Paris um, to draw in, mm. and uh, I slept outside, um, you know, in a bush actually. <laughs> but I was specifically sort of inspired by the Grand Gallery, you, you know, where there's David and Jericho. And mm. in those days, it was also Corbet. Um, the studio wasn't in the Jeu de Pomme, it was in the Louvre. So mm. I could 
the great Barry Levon Hans and Corbe Studio, alongside in the next room, David and Jericho. I guess I fell in love, you know, with the whole thing. Um, yeah. and, I, and I read that Corbe had, um, well, he'd been rejected by everyone. Um, mm. And uh, I was very interested in him for being an outsider, like a kind of a maverick. And I, I think that Delacroix in his journals, he mentions him once, uh, that there's this extraordinary tent outside the salon, which is separate from everything. And there was this studio that he studied and enjoyed. So at least Delacroix of all of the artists appreciated Corbet. So I was thinking a lot about them and I found in a bin in Paris, a book by Hibbard on Michelangelo, and I was very fascinated by that, of course. Mm. I just kept on studying and drawing uh, and uh, yeah. more and more in love with it all, I suppose. Yeah, no, it's interesting that Delacour comes into it because he had a good eye, you know, he was one of the first people to, to get onto Goya, you know, he was, as a, as a, in his late teens, he came across a, a copy of the Los Caprichos, one of the first ones to leave Spain and kind of obsessively was doing that. So clearly Delacroix kind of had, had his, uh, yeah, I don't know. I, love I, I had a good eye like that. And as the tiger as well, not just because he paints them, but because he was uh, quite slashing in his wit, you know, he was, he was very sharp. Um, and, and I, I, I I believe he enjoyed pop culture of his time too. He had good friends. He was good friends with Alexandre Dumas, mm. enjoyed the Count of Monte Cristo, and he had a great deal of the Shakespeare. So Delacroix uh, was marvellous. I think there's a rumour, it might not be true, that he was the bastard son of Talleyrand, who was the club-footed, strange courtesan that, well, he was a... Mm -hmm interesting and brilliant chameleon that ended up working with Napoleon. Um, in fact, Delacroix painted this magnificent work, um, Dante and Virgil crossing the river Styx, mm -hmm. which is a very poor version of Jericho's raft, because yeah. he idolised Jericho and posed for him in his painting, the Medusa, in the front. Mm -hmm. uh, and Delacroix, he couldn't afford the frame, um, because these in those days, the frame were very important for the salons, um, but it just turned up at the salon. Um, and people say that it was a gift from Gro, the painter. Mm. Really, it was most likely to have been paid for by his mysterious father, Talleyrand. <laughs> well, I, I didn't know. I didn't know that rumor. This is this is always what's so so much fun about talking to people who are deeply immersed in the stuff. Is you know little little tidbits like that. But um, yeah, I know. Well. I have to look into it afterwards, but okay. So, but back to your your own work. You ended up, you know, having all of this arts background, but you ended up studying philosophy. Why was that rather than going to art school, rather than following a kind of well, I really, route? You know, I I really wanted to go to the Royal Academy. Mm. And if not that, I read about Augustus John, so the slave would have done. Mm. My father had done all of these things. Um, he'd been a Royal Academician and he thought it was rubbish, you know, that I wouldn't learn anything there. And he was right. Um, I would have learned nothing. Uh, but at the time he was pretty persuasive. And uh, I remember being in some greasy spoon with him and cafe and him saying, look, Wolf, you know, if you want to throw your life away and apply to all of these dreadful art schools, go ahead. But you know, you have the qualifications, you can do university instead. Mm. And um, so uh, there was a point where he was starting to get upset and I couldn't, you know, allow that to happen. Uh, so I said, oh, it's no problem, I'll, I'll go to university. Yeah. And then kind of got on the train and started reading some dreadful Bertrand Russell and that was the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> Who later on I just thought was total rubbish. But we ended up doing contemporary epistemology in Wittgenstein, which was amazing. Yeah. Well, I mean, in, in our in our brief conversations before um, before this interview, Wittgenstein comes up so much in terms of your art. So I'm sure we're like, we, you know, we'll come back, come back to that. And actually, you know, philosophy, reading about your work and, and viewing your work, you know, it's 
as an art historian, the immediate thing that I would engage with is are all of these quotations, all of these fun references. It's like, oh, I, I, I know this game. I can understand that. But actually the juxtapositions are not, or are they even juxtapositions, are so laced with sort of concepts around history and ideas of history. So I wondered if you could talk, I mean, you've recently been doing these juxtapositions of um, figurative old masters with flower paintings. And I wonder if you can talk about what, you're trying to do, bringing these things together, bring, bring I, these different artworks together? I, I don't like any of them anymore. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm not sure what sort of provoked me to do such a thing. Um, I, I really don't think it's the way to go anymore. Um, but I do remember roughly what I was thinking. I, I was thinking along the wrong lines, you know, postmodernism and state of play. Mm material and history not being accessible in any real sense because it's the argument that Derrida had with Foucault about this you could never really understand what a, um, an asylum was in the 18th century so so why are you presenting it to us as a fact you know mm. in, in his unabridged history of madness and civilization um, so I do think that yes there history is problematic you know it's not it's, it's, I agree it's not a Hegelian linear line from A to B. But at the time, yes, I was working along the lines of many other artists in the contemporary art world, like George Kondo or mm. Glenn Brown, there are so many, John Curran, that are sort of, in the 90s, were pretty much engaging with that postmodernist philosophy. Yeah. Um, and that's the kind of, that's like the sort of death of the author, the, yeah, I mean, if you can expand on yeah a bit. yeah um so so that's not to say you see that there are that there are systems of thought there are ways of thinking that can be extremely revealing but i think that the the main problem with postmodernism has been this state of play the the, the lack of hierarchies um since world war Two has naturally existed for reasons that people don't become um they don't create essential archetypal truth systems and mm. do horrific things because of them and then translate it into the arts, of course. You don't engage with an ism anymore that's going to change the world in some modernist utopian way like Corbusier thought. Or, yeah. um, so, so, of course, the, there were artists that were suspicious of that at the time, like Picasso, and I find them very interesting. Um, but the... The, 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 the new way of thinking, I think, today of the, the Zoomers, you know, that are playing Minecraft interests me a lot more. Yeah. <laughs> you know? So if, you, if you're going to reapproach it, because you said, you know, you, you didn't actually really like those, the, the sort of the flower paintings juxtaposed with the, the Zerberan and your state or, you know, wh whichever one, whichever one I might end up picking. Um, what, what are you working on at the moment in terms of these art historical? Okay, well, it's... it's narratives and... I suppose it's not that I dislike them. I'm being a little, yeah. yeah. They're, they're, I suppose within the limited understanding I had at the time, they were sort of brave attempts, you know, at trying to say something. Um, I was actually, you know, not interested in juxtaposition. I hate juxtaposition. I hate collage. I don't like George Bataille. I'm not interested in some situationist rupture. Um, none of that, you know, I, I just find that all really childish, you know? Mm -hmm. And Max Ernst, and I really, really don't like Dali. So, so, so this sort of notion of juxtaposition in order to create some kind of, you know, thought-provoking, whatever, it's just uh, it, it fails, you know. But the the um, but I, what I was interested in it was uh, a seamless use of technology, um, usually Adobe products at that time, you know, which now have been surpassed by so many more interesting softwares and plugins. But I was interested in using a a seamless way of manipulating images from history and then cross-pollinating them with other um, systems of thought from different centuries and from different geographies. So you could take the work of um, Jan Vermeer from the 17th century and cross-pollinate mm -hmm. it with really, really oughtn't to be with Jan Vermeer. <laughs> okay. Um, 
Yeah, of course, something will happen, right? If you if you take two things like two different objects and smash them together like Flintstones, something will happen that's not going to be Vermeer, and it's it's you know it's 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 not going to be something else. The other artists. So so the this is this was like a kind of a fascination of a child that's sort of playing with mud pies, you know. So what's going to happen, and what's going to happen, uh, and then of course all of these different things start sort of. Um, entertaining you you know and mm. then you start taking it seriously and that is the dangerous point <laughs> you know so but when I didn't things take start it. to happen when things actually start yeah. to happen you can ask the question and then what's the things will happen and uh, and, and usually um that is perfectly and seamlessly um and very astutely connected to the financial world do you see so so of course the worst scenario an artist can get them in in, an artist can be in is to take themselves seriously number one <laughs> two to actually believe that the five have anything to do whatsoever with their art <laughs> which is <laughs> the case, uh, because that whole thing is a monopoly and a cartel and absolutely uh, <laughs> so so once you get that then you start really um trying to engage uh y you know in a different way which is a decentralized way with the whole thing mm. And what do you mean by that? This idea of the sort of decentralized. So, if you is, is this when you're combining, not juxtaposing, but you know, combining these different moments? Yeah. What What do you mean by by that? I suppose if history isn't linear, mm. uh, then the next question is, well, what is it? <laughs> if it's right. linear, um, we're living it now. Um, it's a kind of uh, history is decentralized. So what would that mean? It's like a kind of a, a different series of communities and tribes that somehow communicate with each other uh, with interoperability. So if that were the case, then um, unfortunately they're all dead. <laughs> you know? But of course, if, uh, you know, if you don't, yes, only. <laughs> don't let that get in the way, the possibilities are left. Yeah, it's the same no, I certainly don't. I mean, you know, I spend most of my days writing sort of art history and researching art history. I don't, I don't let it get in the way that they're dead. I mean, maybe it should, but, you know. Uh, yeah. Well, um, it, it's easier to explain it outside of the history of art, actually. If you think mm -hmm. about science, I, mean, I, I don't sort of adhere to the idea of progressive science or technology, but let's just use that as an example. Um, the best way of understanding it is to look at philosophers like Coons or Paul Feyerabend who talk about science as non-progressive. Mm. And um, Feyerabend, who was a really interesting philosopher who came from, I think, I think he was in Berkeley University in the 70s. Uh, he used to have witches and um, seminars with witches. Black Panther were there and it was all, there was lots of student riots. It was quite an interesting time for a philosopher to be teaching at a university. If they were even allowed to be at the university, because I think a lot of the teachers did, went on strike. Um, so, so anyway, he talked about um, Galileo a lot. And in one particular instance, he mentions the argument that Galileo had with the church. And in, specifically Cardinal Bellamani. Mm. And um, the argument was really interesting because if you look at the average school textbook or something, it's always um, presenting Galileo as the martyr and the church as the hooligan. But Feyerabend turns it the other way around and he's very fair on Cardinal Bellamani. Um, there was a toy that uh, Galileo found in Venice a telescope and he looked through this and thought this I can improve and then he developed it and he showed Cardinal Bellamani that the moon was not smooth it wasn't perfectly made and God creates things so what's going on here and the church Innocent X and Cardinal were very upset but their argument was well look we're looking for a distorted pretty weird lens here I mean <laughs> you know? um, and Galileo was saying no this is a proof that it, of course it's not a scientific proof at all it's just a hypothesis that's kind of, it's a very dodgy way of actually presenting information in, in, in the normal sense of science. 
Um, and if you look at a telescope today, like the Hubble or something, or, or, or even one of the finest land telescopes that we have, it's going to look indescribably different to what Galileo showed Cardinal Bellamani. Mm. Why I'm going on about Galileo and the Cardinal and an art talk, yeah, is, is because, and I, I think importantly, because Fireband's arguing that Cardinal Bellamani may have been right. And, <laughs> and this is a very radical point of view. So this would mean that if you took Leonardo Vinci and humanism and all of the extraordinary things that were going on in Florence at that time with the great thinkers of Pico della Mirandola and Marcello Ficino, you know, the Platonic Five, uh, taking all of the books from Averroes and translating Aristotle, that all of this was supposed to be the way forwards. And that because they'd found this extraordinary method that Alberti used with perspective and they could bring things forwards technologically, scientifically, economic. Um, it, it, you know, uh, it's no, absolutely no coincidence that this all happened at the same time as double bookkeeping that Luca Pacioli invented for the Medici. And, you know, you had all of the immense ability suddenly to make money and bank. Um, so that's happening again right now. And that's what I'm interested in. Um, you know, it's happening with the blockchain, it's happening with Ethereum, with Vitalik Buterin, um, and with DAOs. And what we have now is the beginning of decentralized finance connected with people's sale, you know, human one. Um, and Pac, you know, Murat Pak with his Lost Poets and his Merge, that's happening right now. So it's happening again, but in an absolutely revolutionary way. And I very excited by that, just as much as Alberti would have been excited about Palladio and perspective. Do you see? Yeah, I, I, I think I, you know, I think I see. I think you know, when when one's so sort of immersed in in history, the bring it the bring it forward. You know, everyone you know everyone says that history is so relevant to the present and it's so it's so important. And actually, I don't often see people thinking in that way. You know, they don't, people don't practice what they preach. They say, okay, all of this history that I'm studying and I'm researching is so great, it's so interesting. But then, you know, what you've just done, which is sort of considering it in the context of, you know, the Renaissance. I mean, does this make you very hopeful about the current state of innovation and the current, you know, this might create a research, you know, or, or a, a new renaissance, I suppose. Do you, do you think that it will have those implications? Because, you know, they're also, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, I'm very hope on both sides. In these kids playing Minecraft as it's creative. Um, they understand the modern world, the, the Zoomers do. Um, the millennials probably sort of do. Like, <laughs> And the next stage is like, this is insane. And they kind of do and Then it's like, I hate it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Rubbish, you know. Uh, but quite honestly, I, I do think that what's most important about it is the, um, the when, some, when a revolution occurs in the arts, it has to have a connection with finance, of course. It has to economically make sense. And it, mm. it also needs to be part of... Um, a new kind of revolution. So for, uh, in, in, in data, in, in learning. So for instance, you know, you get Gutenberg and then you get Jura and, you know, you've got all of these things going on that yeah. are necessary for Jura to do his engravings or for Luther to slam on the door, for Wittenberg, whatever. Yeah. yeah. So, so, so if that happens, then revolutions occur. The church is turned upside down. Today's church is just sort of, dreadful in the art world. I mean, you've just got an awful bunch of families that are controlling the whole system. You know, they, it's the opposite of a community. It's the opposite of decentralized. It's, it's totally corporate from the top down. So you'll have a system where the poor artist is got the long arm of some patriarch around them and they're told to sort of slave away and make some art. And we'll deal with your PR. We'll deal with the publications will make sure that you get your your show your exhibition and we'll deal with the museums and the creators and, and then of course they got about 250 artists on their stock and those artists are very rarely ever going to get any exhibitions and they just become mm. slaves um so the new world which i hope 
um, that artists can engage with um, the new generation, you know, the teens, the mm. 12 year olds really, that are, that are starting to look at this now, they'll own the world because they're already way ahead of the art world. You know, the art world's just like meat. It's, it's meat world, which means that it's all about the flesh and the physical objects. None of these, none of these teenagers want anything physical at Christmas. You know? How do you, so, mm, okay, sorry, go ahead. You will finish your thought. Yeah, they, they just want digital in their Christmas. Yeah. So this shift, this shift from digital, because your art historically is, with, you know, a lot of your art has been so steeped in craft as well. You know, you have, there all, there's all of this concept, there's all the, but you are also, you know, an exceptional trained painter and draftsman and your drawings and all of these things. That's, that's a really central thing. With the dawning of this immaterial world of art you know with 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 the digital as you're saying with these with these different things how do you think how do you feel about craft within that is that is it just going to change is it going to be using you know there's a lot of ai creations of like brush what looks like brushwork or you know whatever it might be or do you think that actually mm -hmm. you know craft is lost you know craft, craft will will die but no craft is just going to improve <laughs> so, okay. I hope so. <laughs> that's the wrong word. It's, it, it's going to go through mutagenesis. Mm -hmm. uh, it's like a rabbit that suddenly changes into something else. And you don't happen so fast, it's like, how the hell? You know? Um, so, so, what will happen is this is, first of all, there's a, a lot of, there's a lot, there's a, there's a great deal of, um, there's a large chasm or space between the the, the tools that a digital artist is au fait with and the tools that the, the artist of the trad, trad art, the traditional world is used mm. to. So traditional artists for a long time has been holding a brush and it's all to do with the elbow and the wrist and that kind of dexterity of the fingers and of course, ultimately the mind. But the, the point is, is that when you see Jackson Pollock throwing around a lot of paint or even worse, Damien Hirst trying to pellet something with a stick. Oh God. Um, <laughs> not having a go at Jackson Pollock, but when you see that, um, what you have is a is a is someone who's trying to sort of deconstruct or get away from the wrist and move it more towards the elbow. So you see it a lot in the film The Rebel with Tony Hancock. You know, he gets on the bicycle and moves the stuff around the canvas with the bicycle wheel. Anything to get away from the wrist. Yeah, digital art has gone clearly a long way from that in many ways. But people don't realize that it's still the rest in many ways with digital art. You still have a Wacom tablet. You still have a pen. You, you're still using drawing skills. You, in ZBrush, you're sculpting pretty much similarly to how, you, how you, all, with all the same drawing skills that you would need if you were in Thor of Alsdom's workshop in Denmark mm -hmm. in the century. You need all of that. Um, the, the, these people that are creating the Lion King. I'm not saying that I think I'm putting the Lion King <laughs> same level or whatever, aesthetically or intellectually or whatever to a Renaissance painting, but, but the Lion King, of course, is extremely skilled. Now, the difference between what's happening now and the people that are working, crafting all of these UVs, all of these um, displacement maps and, and uh, uh, beautiful geometry on a lion, the difference is that they are working within an industry that demands that they go from, they specialize in one particular area. I will do the topology. That's like the perfect planes of the lion. The other person will say, I will do the texturing. And then they have to work between each other perfectly and seamlessly. But the mm. artist, the crusty artist in the bedroom, the team, okay, <laughs> they're just using all of it without any rule. They don't have to produce Thaos or a Hollywood movie. So they, they become this insanely creative, mad sort of NFT, do you see? Um, and right. there it becomes very interesting. Um, there it becomes possible again. Um, that, but of course, everything now is learned online. There's no more universities. There's no more, you know, all of the new fashion wear isn't going to be retail. You know, it'll all be uh, buy to wear and... <laughs> 
in the metaverse. You know, it's going to be exciting. And uh, I believe that if you go back in time to Jan van Eyck that we were talking about earlier, mm. and he was there, he was working for the Ghent Altarpiece doing these large triptychs. And then for Philip the Good, I think. And then all of a sudden he's making something for Arnold Feeney. What's, what's happening there? This tiny little panel that a merchant owns. Um, well, they didn't really frown upon that, but that was a revolution because the small donor portraits could be made on these little panels that aren't too different from iPads. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm fully aware of the difference between the shiny screen of an iPad and, and uh, what traditionalists would see as an exquisite and beautiful skin of the paint of Jan van mm. with all of the immense skill that... Uh, miracle skill that an artist like that uses. I'm only using it as a very loose metaphor that there were revolutions before that John Mabwe would have looked at Jan van been shocked. But it hit Italy hard when Hugh, poor Hugo Dan, van de Goes sent his altarpiece down to Florence and all of the artists, all of those artists flocked around it and thought, how do they do oil paint? Well, that's yeah. the same today. The artists, whoever they are, wherever they are, they're looking, they're watching, and they're thinking one of two things. I don't want anything to do with this. I can't stand this. Or, or financially, it's very interesting. People just made 79 million or Pax just made 91 million. But they're also thinking something else in the back of their minds. Maybe I should learn this. Maybe this is like the new oil paint. Do you see? So there's a lot of out there at the moment, you know? Yeah. And so is this what you're going into now primarily? Is this what you've been working on is sort of digital art? And are you, are you still using the elbow and the wrist? Or yeah. are you I use, sort of... And the reason is the gondolas never leave Venice, do they? Okay, they're still there. The black cabs are still in London, despite Uber. So of course, you know, a painting is going to remain. I'm not one of these maximalists that just mm -hmm. go all out and destroy all of these extraordinary. Um, the, the, in regards to the craft, I wanted to say one thing, um, it, out, out of respect for it, um, and it's, re, it's in relation to Bernini, Girolamo uh, Bernini. Now, um, when he was asked to leave Rome for a short period of time in his 70s, he went to Paris to, well, actually to Versailles to make a sculpture for the Sun King. And um, it was only a small bust. In fact, he was expected to redo the design of the whole of the palace, but that didn't happen because they're very French and they didn't, they needed to know that Bernini was focused on the king's comfort, not just on his godlike visions of architecture. So the, the reason I'm mentioning Bernini specifically is because they placed him in a greenhouse on the site of Versailles with smashed windows. And in order to sculpt the king. Um, and it was very cold for a 70 year old man and he sculpted it and completed it within three months, which is absolutely extraordinary. I don't think anyone has ever done it after him, plenty before him, but no one has done something like that craft wise since Bernini, apart from a robot, yeah? And right. with far less finesse. So the, the thing is, is that Bernini had to walk around the statue from many angles. He had to have the dust and the marble over him. He was extremely stressful. And when he finally showed it to the king, he broke down um, in some kind of emotional state where he was crying. And as you can imagine, an eccentric Italian in the French court where all of their manners were extremely cultivated, it was not on. So Paul Bernini had embarrassed the king and the king didn't know what to say. Um, but it was okay because Louis XIV is fantastic, you know, he dealt with the situation. <laughs> and, well, he, and Bernini's worth it. Like, you know, you deal with it if you're getting <laughs> pain, but he's worth it. So the point I'm making is that that in philosophy would be called phenomenology. So phenomenology is, you know, when you sort of, it's the relationship between the body and the world. And this mm. is extremely important. So what I'm saying, is not just the wrist, that you know, the, the whole oh. Pollock dancing around you now on his in 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 springs on his painting, um, in, in, in the Hamptons, 
is, is to do more with the phenomenon of his body being free in the world and so on, and the relationship between his body and the work. Um, and in, in a similar way, there is no difference between that and Bernini walking around like a kind of old, old animal um, and, and trying to understand all of the perfect angles of Louis XIV's portrait. And there's no difference between you putting some kind of crazy wearable on and going into the metaverse and experiencing that in, in, in the future of its unity or if it's going to be um, Unreal Engine and you're going to be experiencing that in, in VR, that is going to be one of the most extraordinary phenomenological experiences anyone could ever have. And Bernini would have been in there. Will, although you talk about the marble dust on the skin mm -hmm. and the cold. Yeah. I mean, is VR going to do that? Is VR going to going to give you the feeling of, of oil paint through your, you know, and, and, and the sense of being covered in marble dust and, and being freezing in a greenhouse in the gardens of Versailles? I, I don't know. Hey, this argument's been going on for 500 years. You see, Leonardo, was, Leonardo da Vinci was particularly interested in that question. And that's why um, he, he, he made it as clear as he could that he would not want to look like some wild baker, like, Angelo, covered in marble dust, where the marble was sticking to his sweat and making him basically some kind of slave animal. Um, Leonardo was all about trying to make something cerebral. And the, the, the more he could maneuver his art away from the physical and the gestural, the better. This is why, if you look at uh, uh, the Mona Lisa or the South, actually not the Salvador Mundi, but the Mona Lisa. Um, <laughs> let's not get into that one. So the point. <laughs> The Mona Lisa, the more you realize frustrates are extraordinarily exquisite and almost imperceptible. Um, mm -hmm. Technique was d developed that way on purpose so that it became almost cerebral. The texture of the surface of the painting is like porcelain. And other artists like Dominique Angra and, uh, and many others, they, they were fascinated by that. Um, so, so there's not, the, you, you try to imagine when you look at um, uh, a a beautiful 417K screen of a Samsung. Um, and you look at a, a great work of art by um, a, a digital artist, you might find that it has even more resolution than the millennial portrait of Albert Dürer. Where do you go from that? So, so you see, it's not about, oh, I see. So, so we're gonna lose the physical, we're gonna lose the sense of smell and, and, and the feeling of the cold because we're stuck in the somehow that's going to de-soul us or dry up our, 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 our sort of, um, you know, consciousness in some way and turn us into a sack of potatoes. No, you know, it's, it's an engagement of the highest order. Yeah, I mean, I, I haven't yet experienced it. You know, I mean, one can only really imagine because I think we're not quite there yet. I mean, in terms of the sort of the full, fully immersed, although maybe we are, maybe I just haven't experienced the technology. There. I yeah. mean, it's, it, it, it's, it's, it's happening so fast. Um, six years in the traditional art world is like six mm -hmm. in the world of digital. These poor digital artists before they broke through this year, actually. Mm -hmm hanging around with crummy sandwiches in Paris opera houses, having meetups. No one even cared about them. And they've been working on these inspiring ideas for a long time. And they, of course, now everyone's waking up because it's making money. Yeah. But there are inspired people out there like Vitalik Buterin who um, really want good things to happen. You know, they, they're extraordinary individuals. And these, the people that understand this are teenagers. They're the only ones. They get it, you know? Um, so I think that New World belongs to the 12-year-old. I really do. I think they can run the businesses too. You know, they, they will. The new corporations, they'll all be 12. Yeah, well, we'll, we'll live to see it, you know. Well, hopefully, touch wood. Uh, you know, we'll have to live to see it. But it's, um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a real, we're having a real swerve at the moment, you know, the... the craft and materiality and and medium and 
Um, and you know, and, and there's a lot of there's a lot of cynicism as well around w within NFTs. You know, people who who are creating these. I know this this conversation went from <laughs> something that's going to be about old masks and all of that, but to NFTs. I mean, there is a lot of cynicism. There are people who are just creating them, making quick bucks, and not thinking about these sorts of philosophical ideas. So, you know, the the slight cynic in me is thinking that perhaps the market, the 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 inherent cynicism of the market will come in and slightly ruin this utopia that's possible, you know, these possibilities, but, but possibly not either. Maybe, maybe I'm just too, too jaded. <laughs> not that. I think that you've, you've made a you know, really relevant, powerful point about the art world having issues with um, the uh, NFTs just being associated with um, liquidity and money and not having any soul. Well, take a look at Jack Coons. I mean, you know, come on. <laughs> yeah, that's, happening, that's happening in the, in the real world as well. And, and on this point, this is reminding me of this, this discussion in, in museums about museums selling NFTs, you know, selling images of their artworks, you know, as, as NFTs online. What uh, do you think about that? <laughs> well, it's, it's different actually, because the originally, and it's really good um, that the museums did Creative Commons with Nefertiti, for example, in Berlin. Mm. Um, they allowed Nefertiti to become and belong, the 3D scan of Nefertiti to belong to the world. And good for them. Um, now they might be regretting it. <laughs> you know, but a lot of the museums are starting to sort of wake up, hang on a minute, you know, maybe I can make $170,000 selling the NFT of Michelangelo's Donny Tondo, which the Fitzy did, or the Hermitage, oh, I can sell a Leonardo NFT. And at the same time, this somehow isn't contradictory to the fact that it's related at all to the original artwork, which it isn't because the NFT is a unique artwork separate from the, but it's slightly more blurred when it comes to the 3D scans, do you see? Because they are connected literally in, in many ways, they're extremely faithful replicas of the originals. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, the, the, the museums need so badly to fund themselves since lockdown. Um, they've been destroyed from the inside out. The government's been pulling funding. You can see people during lockdown picketing outside the Royal Academy because they're losing their jobs. So you really feel, well, if they can monetize it with NFTs, then great, you know? Then good for them if they have the imagination to do that. Um, just, just in regards to finance and the art world though, mm -hmm. The very important point is the art world is opaque. You cannot see through it. It is not interested in transparency. This is how the dealers work. This is how they make money. Um, it's, a, it's a kind of um, unregulated sort of form of money laundering on a vast scale. They're worse than Narcos, okay? Right. <laughs> I mean, everyone knows it, you know. So, so if you accept that that the art world has become a kind of Colombian um, uh, cabal, yeah, yeah, of of, of coke and heroin. Um, that the art itself is, of course, completely insignificant, you know. And then you add that to the dreadful BBC coverage of trying to educate people at the moment with the um, the critics that basically talk to the general public as if they're all suffering from some kind of dementia or Alzheimer's. Yeah, then you've got a dreadful system. So what at least you're having with the NFT world is a re-education that artists can have freedom. They, they can have royalties. They don't need to be slaves. They can go out there and be decentralized. They can form DAOs. They can collect art. Is it, I'm thinking with the digital image, so this is this is not in response to the art world being a terrible place, which again I think is a conversation for another Zoom, because <laughs> this is a whole it's a whole whole discussion. But the selling, I mean, your art is quoting a lot, directly quoting a lot from artwork that is in museums. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If someone were to own an NFT of an artwork that you're then quoting from, mm -hmm. and then you're selling that, isn't it? I mean. Will, could the NFT, could this sort of copyright, could it close down creativity? Could it, could it limit that? Could you not be able to do that because you're, you know, plagiarizing on someone else's digital artwork because they happen to own, you know, whereas, whereas images at the moment and, and, and art 
has always been this this freedom you know people went to the louvre and you know artists have forever gone to the louvre and copied and yet now that there is this sort of digital fingerprint of it but you know, do you yeah. see that as possibly posing a problem for you and no not at all i mean i, I it's no different from someone like you see art is not like athena i i don't mean Athena Art Foundation. <laughs> Athena, I believe, was a goddess that was born from nothing. Um, she was just somehow materialized from nothing. From Zeus's head, I think. Yeah, exactly. Um, Isn't Athena the one that comes out of the top of his head? Yeah, she's just sort of like born. But the most important thing is in full art, okay? So, so she didn't evolve. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah, she didn't. She right. Didn't okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just like, where is this going? <laughs> That's great. She didn't evolve. It's, yeah. Like Athena, it's, it's not born and separate from history or separate from other styles. Um, you know, clearly Van Dyck was influenced by Rubens, his master, and Rubens was influenced by Michelangelo, and Michelangelo was influenced by looking at the poly, the the the, the, the Laocoon, and which he dug up. Exactly. It just, the Laocoon is a copy of the actual. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So it goes on and on and on. And 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 you once you understand the um, that if you engage intuitively and honestly with um, something as extraordinary as Myron's Discopolis, uh, mm -hmm. or a, a creation by Phidias and you just produce pastiche, then forget it. You're just going to be depressed. But if you can find a way in, like a true explorer, then it will reveal something else. And you will become uh, in a state of wonder. And so will others. So this cannot be closed down. This is creativity. It doesn't matter if it's an NFT or if it's in the trad art world that wonder will only happen if someone has had the courage to, um, to find an entry point in history, which is all around us every day and not trapped in some kind of time capsule, you know? Yeah. Wolf, I think we are 10 minutes over the time that I said our interview would be because I knew this would be like that. So I feel like that's a really beautiful place to wrap up. And um, there's so much food for thought here, whether it's on NFTs, whether it's on the, the some sort of place of history and all what even is history and how, 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 it, how it connects and how it combines and exists and all of these ideas. I mean, you know, I'm sure our conversations will, will continue into the future and, and hopefully we can uh, do another live or something else uh, sometime as well. But it's... Um, Your time. Yes. Yeah, no, thank, thank you so much. And thank you everyone who's been, who's been watching this. This will, be, uh, the Athena, this will be on the Athena Art Foundation's IGTV if you didn't see the whole thing, so you'll be able to watch it back. So yes, Wolf, thank you so much. Uh, have a wonderful evening and thank you everyone else. Thank you. All right.